just to let you know, we're going to be going to the book of Psalms uh, this morning, but uh, by way of introduction, I'd uh, just like to ask everyone a question, a rhetorical type question that you can answer in your own hearts uh, this morning. But uh, uh, I'm sure you have, as I have come across numerous of these in my uh, walk with the Lord. Uh, have you ever had what I refer to as a aha moment? Uh, something occurs in your lifetime where uh, through deeper Bible study, you're able to really see the truth of God's word uh, lived out in your own life and, and, and really become a, uh, a shot in the arm, if I would uh, uh, say that. In fact, uh, Roger, uh, this past week had made uh, reference to a term, or maybe it was the previous week, uh, and I've often referred to that myself, that oftentimes God will give us uh, little nuggets of gold as we study his word. And um, uh, my own experience has been on occasions, those nuggets of gold are meant uh, uh, at a given moment for uh, we as an individual. It's been my experience at times when uh, I have uh, found one of those nuggets of gold uh, at a given moment in my life. And uh, in an effort to share that with someone, it just did not seem to come out as exciting as what uh, it was delivered to me um, uh, through the Holy Spirit, and, and, and sometime I've had to realize that sometime God, uh, just like a faithful father, uh, he likes to give us little things that mean something to just us at that given moment, and those little nuggets of gold can be precious as we uh, study God's word, and so uh, I begin this morning by sharing with you an, a, a, an experience that I had in my own life a number of years ago, uh, being on staff at Heatherwood Baptist Church in Riverdale, Georgia, um, and responsibility, various uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, outreach and evangelism, and uh, minister of children. Uh, and uh, Deb and I both was very, very active uh, and uh, a part of the preaching ministry there at that church as well. And so we were very involved. And I only say that not, uh, uh, not to paint myself up, but just to lead you into the discussion that we're going to have this morning. Uh, my great aunt, uh, who we were uh, primary caretakers for, she was more like a grandmother to me, uh, had a elderly sister that lived in Alabama and she wanted to go and see her sister. Her sister was near death. And so one, early one Saturday morning, uh, we got up and we left uh, uh, the Atlanta uh, area and went to uh, Coleman, Alabama uh, to take my aunt to see her um, uh, dying sister. On the way back, coming down Interstate 65, everything was great. It had been a very good uh, productive visit. Um, and uh, my uh, aunt was so glad that she was able to see her sister um, uh, going uh, 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 70 miles an hour down Interstate 65. All of a sudden, my check engine light came on, and within seconds, uh, my engine seized, and I pulled over to the side on Interstate 65. I blew an engine. And I got to tell you that I wish I could uh, testify to you this morning uh, that I claimed uh, the book of James uh, chapter 1 verse 2 uh, where it uh, tells us that in the midst of trials and temptations that we have uh, we're to count it as joy. Uh, I struggled with uh, uh, mustering up a little bit of joy uh, during that time period and in a midst of things like that when those kinds of things happen to us uh, Satan does uh, uh, have a way of of magnifying the issue to such a point where uh, we uh, lead ourselves into a period of discouragement. And uh, I got to tell you that uh, during that time period, my uh, life was um, uh, experiencing some really great things through the ministry of the Lord. Um, uh, but I got to say that uh, 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 before we actually get into our uh, psalms there, I believe that there are times, and we all have to be very cautious of this, I believe there are times in our life where uh, we can become so busy doing the work for the Lord that we miss the work of the Lord in our own lives. 
And I think I was bordering on that at that time. There was just so many responsibilities and things. And oftentimes I would get so busy that uh, uh, unfortunately the work of the Lord in me um, uh, was suffering. And I really didn't realize that until I went through this period uh, in my own life. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, it was during that time period that uh, I began to question and say, Lord, I don't understand why it is, and this is the age-old question, and uh, uh, Pastor Casey has been sharing with us the importance of sharing our faith and what uh, those who uh, would try to put us down uh, will say. One of the first questions they always uh, seem to want to put to us is, if God is really good, then why does bad things happen to good people? And uh, that's always been a struggle. And I think each of us has probably at one time or another in our life uh, experienced that. And having said that, uh, let's turn now to the 73rd chapter of the book of Psalms, Psalms 73. And as you're turning there, I'll say that uh, this psalm was written by uh, an individual by the name of Asaph. Asaph was a, um, a trusted uh, uh, servant of the Lord. In fact, uh, uh, he was the primary, um, I will call him choir leader. Uh, in fact, it was Asaph that was chosen to lead the music when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back in. David chose Asaph uh, to lead that uh, worship time together. Uh, and so he was a very trusted uh, individual. And Asaph uh, uh, struggled with some of the things that, uh, and in my uh, study during that period of time in my life, I began to look uh, at instances where um, others had experienced times of discouragement. And uh, this was one of the first chapters that jumped out at me at Psalms, the 73rd chapter. And that first verse, I think, is very um, uh, telling. It says, uh, Asaph uh, uh, very much uh, right off the bat uh, agrees to the fact that uh, he knows that God is good uh, to Israel. It says there, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a good heart. Uh, Psalms 34, 8 says, taste of the Lord and see that he is good. That verse uh, reminds me of a, a time I, uh, I belonged to a organization when I was at Delta Airlines called uh, uh, FCAP, Fellowship of Christian Airline Personnel. And uh, the individual who founded that organization, I had the privilege of hearing him speak once, and he told the story of how he was a pilot for Delta Airlines. And he told the story of how that uh, uh, as he was uh, boarding a uh, plane to fly to New York, as he got on board, the flight attendants, all of the flight crew was heavy in a conversation before the passengers had begun boarding uh, with regard to that question that I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, if it is true that God is good, then why does bad things happen to good people? And so the whole uh, uh, discussion was around, is God good? And uh, so uh, the, pass, the uh, pilot of the plane being uh, known as a Christian, uh, he went ahead and finished his pre-flight check-in and, and uh, sitting in the pilot's uh, seat, uh, uh, flew them to New York. But he could tell that even uh, during the flight that uh, there was still some conversation going on with regard to, is God good? And as he began to leave the aircraft when it got there to New York, and uh, the, uh, they, knowing him and his uh, testimony, walked up to him and said, okay, so you've said nothing about what we've been talking about. Um, uh, so what is your opinion? Is God good? And the father was standing there holding a cup of coffee, and he held that coffee, and he looked at it, and he said to the uh, flight crew there, every single one of you see me sitting, standing here holding this cup of coffee. And we could have debated from the time we left our uh, point of origin to this uh, gate here in New York as to whether or not this coffee is sweetened with sugar. He said, but there's only one way in which you're going to know for sure whether or not it is. And that's the taste of it. And he said, until you have tasted of my Lord, then you're not going to know of his true goodness. And that just really stuck in my mind for a number of years. And when I first read this verse, I thought about that. And I thought about truly God is good. 
uh, to us. And, and so Asaph was clearly uh, uh, stating that up front, that he wanted to make sure that everyone understood that he knew God is good to Israel, uh, even to such as a, of a clean heart, he says there. But then he says, you know, there's a problem here, though, and, and, and he struggled with that because having already said that God is good, he says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. First Peter 5 verse 8 tells us, and it's so true, Satan is like a roaring lion. He goes about looking and, and trying to find any opportunity he can do to devour us. And oftentimes in these times of discouragement is where he um, uh, becomes most successful. And so Asaph was saying, look, I, I really uh, struggle with this. I know that God is good, uh, but I, my feet have almost slipped into this very, very slippery um, uh, slope. And so it's very, very important for us to realize when we begin to experience those slippery slopes, we need to get into God's word. Uh, and, but he goes on there in the third verse and he says, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When we consider that word foolish there, I'm reminded of Psalms, the 14th chapter, verse one. And again, Casey, uh, Pastor Casey has uh, shared with us uh, uh, points with regard to uh, how foolish sometimes people can be and trying to declare that there is no God. It's always interest me, the bumper sticker that uh, we've often spoke of and seen uh, uh, that uh, shares with us that God said it, uh, I believe it, and that settles it. But in fact, the real truth of the matter is God said it, and it really doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, it's settled in all eternity. And the foolish, in the 14th chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 1, it says there, the fool has said in his own heart, um, uh, there uh, is no God. And we really, if we consider the fact that uh, those words, again, Roger had made mention in some of his teaching that oftentimes, uh, particularly in the King James Bible, when you see words uh, that are italicized, those words were inserted to uh, clarify what is being said uh, so that if you leave those italicized words out, you can get a better flavor for what the uh, original um, uh, language was stating there. And if you'll notice in that 14th chapter of the book of Psalms, if you have time to uh, flip there today, uh, the word there is, is in italics. In reality, what it's saying there is the foo has said, no God. They don't want a God in their life. They, uh, in their uh, spirit, they know because God has placed that knowledge um, uh, uh, in each and every single one of us that there is a God. And so when we say that there is no God, what we're really saying is no God. And so Asaph was saying here, look, I have seen those that uh, uh, would go about their life and, and conduct themselves in a way that uh, is not pleasing unto you. Uh, and I got to I gotta tell you that uh, they seem to prosper and that, uh, that just really bothered him uh, uh, to consider that. In fact, that word prosperity that's used there in the third verse is the word that uh, is translated uh, from the Hebrew word shalom. And we are all familiar with that word shalom. It is a word that is often used in the uh, Jewish circles to uh, indicate to us a, a, a salutation, uh, uh, even a wish of peace to come into our lives. And so in that third verse, he's saying, hey, look, uh, uh, these folks seem to have that kind of peace that we uh, that have followed you closely uh, should have. And he goes on there and says, for there are no bands in their death but their strength is firm. You know, it's almost like uh, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's just, they don't even consider the aspect of judgment following death. And Asaph is just really struggling again over all of this. And the fifth verse there, they are, not, uh, they are not in trouble as other men, neither, have they neither are they plagued like other uh, men. Uh, you know, Satan just seems to continually um, uh, be, as uh, Asaph is stating here, uh, continually be uh, uh, oppressing. And I want to uh, emphasize that. If we have accepted Christ as our personal Savior, no longer can the Satan ever uh, possess us 
but he can and oftentimes does oppress us uh, to keep us in a discouraged state. As long as he can keep us in a discouraged state, he knows uh, that because of our faith in Christ, uh, that he has lost the war. But he tries in every opportunity that he possibly can to uh, defeat us in the small battles in our life. And, and so uh, that is, uh, so he continually comes and tries to oppress us um, uh, to keep us discouraged. I'm reminded of the story I once heard told of a pastor that uh, um, uh, no, don't know that it's uh, uh, exactly true, but uh, uh, the story was told of how in one of his services he stood and he, uh, as he was bringing the message, he asked the question to the congregation, everyone, uh, would you raise your hand if Satan has visited you uh, in this past week in your home? And uh, everybody across the congregation raised their hand. Uh, there was this one um, uh, African-American uh, godly man down sitting on the uh, front pew, and uh, he did not raise his hand. And so the pastor asked again that same question. If, uh, if Satan has visited you uh, in this past week, uh, would you raise your hand? Everyone raised their hand except for that one uh, individual. Uh, finally, the pastor looked down at him and just uh, um, uh, out of amazement said, are you telling me that Satan has never uh, visited you in this past week in your home? And the man stood and said, no, sir, he just stays there all the time. And there's times in our life where we feel that. We feel like it. he doesn't just visit us. It just seems like he's continually uh, oppressing us. But uh, there's still goodness to come. And we're going to see that here uh, as we go on through this chapter. Uh, he even says here that uh, in the sixth verse, therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covers them as a garment. Uh, he's saying there they, they, they wear their pride almost like a gold chain around their neck. Their eyes stand out with fatness. Uh, they have more than their heart uh, could wish. Uh, you know, it just almost seemed like to Asaph, he's saying here that it seemed like that uh, they just got things all together. And how many times have we looked around us at times and we've seen those um, uh, that uh, do not seek the things of the Lord. Uh, and it just seems like, at least uh, outwardly, that they have everything uh, about them. That everything seems to be working out. That eight verse, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning to oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Uh, they're not even uh, concerned about the uh, heavenly things. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are uh, wrung out to them. Uh, obviously, Asaph is very, very discouraged at this time. Uh, D.L. Moody, a story was once told of him, many great stories told of D.L. Moody. Uh, uh, some may be uh, exaggerated, others are absolutely true. Uh, I was told once that D.L. Moody on a stage uh, where he was appearing in a, an apologetic type uh, setting where he was defending the word of God against an atheist, uh, uh, it said that D.L. Moody seated uh, uh, with this uh, individual, and this individual stood and said, if there is a God, and he raised his hands to the heaven, and he said, then let him strike me dead right now. And the story says that D.L. Moody turned to the individual that was sitting next to him, and I could almost imagine him saying this, because I gotta say, I may be in inclined to say the same thing, but he looked over to the gentleman that was sitting next to him and said, oh, if I were only God right now. Uh, it would have been nice if uh, perhaps we had heard in that story that there was an approaching thunderstorm and at that time uh, a, a loud thunder uh, had occurred just to see what that individual would have done. But again, Asaph was discouraged here. He says in the 11th verse, and they say, how doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? They even uh, question the knowledge of Almighty God. And, and it was just a, a, a point in Asaph's life where uh, he, it just really bothered him that this was the case. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. Uh, they increase in riches. Verily, he says, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands. And innocently. This is the point at which Asaph was in. 
He looked around at the opportunities that he had had, no doubt even recalling the time when the ark was brought back into uh, the temple and, and, and the opportunity that he had to lead the worship time together. Um, uh, but he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, wondering, uh, it was all of that in vain. 14th verse, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. He realized that if he made this uh, uh, questioning period in his life uh, one of, of uh, uh, a clarity that, uh, that he was struggling with this uh, aspect, he knew that he could uh, cause others to slip, and that bothered him. And then uh, there in the uh, 16th verse, he finally says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. And you know, there are often times in all of our lives where things are just too painful for us to understand. Maybe we've gotten word of, of a, a very severe sickness uh, at, the, at this time in the life of our nation, there are people who are losing their jobs. There's hurt all around. Uh, I tell Deb oftentimes when uh, I look around and I see people around us, I mentioned to her, there's so many hurting people in the world today. And we know that the answer to that hurt is the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Asaph has gone all the way through these 16 verses and in the final analysis, having stated the problem very clearly, having studied that problem in the uh, second through the 16th verse, he comes to that point in the 17th verse. And this is Asaph's aha moment. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. And so therein lies the answer to the times of discouragement. We have to find our way and remain in the sanctuary of the Lord to stay encouraged and uplifted during times of difficulty. I keep reading of articles about uh, uh, the difficulties of uh, of the stay at home and how people are struggling emotionally uh, uh, to the point where it drives them to do things that they would not normally do. Uh, and in those times, we need to understand the importance of remaining in the sanctuary of the Lord. This is Asaph's aha moment. And, and, and in just a moment, I want us to go and, and look at, okay, so if this is the answer to times of discouragement, then how can we, uh, as individuals, uh, corporately, how can we remain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Asa was not the only one that had encountered these kinds of discouragements. Man, we could go over to the book of Job this morning, and wow, what a tremendous book that is uh, as we consider the uh, circumstances that Job found himself in. Uh, uh, and uh, for the first uh, 12 chapters or so, Job is confronted. We're all familiar with the fact that uh, God had uh, told Satan to uh, consider his servant uh, Job. Uh, and so uh, Job was um, uh, uh, released by God uh, to be uh, uh, tempted by Satan and, and, and the things that had occurred to Satan and, I mean, to uh, Job. And uh, we're told of how that, uh, and I say this tongue in cheek, Job's friends came to him uh, uh, to uh, explain to him uh, their uh, understanding of what was going on in his life. Uh, and all the way up to the 13th chapter, in the 13th chapter, Job said, you know, I just wish I could find God. I just wish I could find him and, and present my case to him. Uh, and so he searched, uh, uh, the scripture says there, uh, to see if he could find uh, God, but he was just uh, unable to find uh, him at that time. Uh, all the way up to the thir 23rd chapter uh, of Job, uh, at that point, uh, uh, he's really uh, 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 searching out God and trying to find him. And then in the 31st chapter, after all of his friends continue to share with them their uh, 
uh, opinion of his circumstances. The 31st chapter, uh, at the close of that chapter, we're told that Job uh, is silent at that point. He finally just uh, uh, just uh, withdraws uh, to within himself. And then we see uh, another friend comes along, by the way, uh, following that 31st chapter. Uh, and then in the 38th chapter, and I love as the crescendo begins to build in the uh, story of Job, in the 38th chapter, God speaks out. And I love those words that he says there in the 38th chapter. Uh, he uh, tells Job in those opening verses there uh, very strongly to gird up his loins and act like a man. And he looks at Job and he says, listen, I'm going to be doing the talking at this point. You have said at one point uh, uh, through this experience that uh, you just wanted to present your case. Uh, he very clearly presents to Job that uh, uh, I am not to be cross-examined. You are going to be the one that, uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, is going to sit here and listen. And it's in those following verses that uh, God presents to Job. Uh, to me, some of the most beautiful words uh, with regard to uh, God's uh, um, activity in the uh, creation of the world. It's there where he says, hey, Job, uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Uh, declare if you then uh, have understanding who hath laid the measures thereof and thou knowest or who has stretched the line upon it whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened he basically told Job hey Job um, uh, who do you think that you are I am the one that has created uh, the world and then we see in the uh, 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 leading up to Job's aha moment in the 40th chapter book of Job, uh, uh, Job says to God, he finally speaks up. He finally says something and he says, you know what? And I'm paraphrase here uh, in that 40th chapter, he, bas he does say, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. Basically, Job says, uh, I now understand clearly uh, what has been going on. He said, uh, uh, and in essence, uh, Job is doing what I would have probably felt like if I had been in his sandals. Uh, I uh, would have uh, said, you know, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth uh, so that I'll no longer put my foot in the mouth. And uh, so he sits and he listens to God. He basically tells God, I am going to just sit over here. I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to listen to your words. So Job also had that aha moment. But I, I got to say that uh, uh, if we're going to uh, uh, understand sometime those difficult periods of discouragement in our life, uh, we are going to have to remain in the sanctuary of God. So the question is then, how can we remain in the sanctuary of the Lord? I mentioned to you uh, in preview of the, uh, or a short statement with regard to the lesson this morning uh, that I was going to encourage you all to become for just a moment um, uh, suffering from dyslexia. Uh, as you call dyslexia is the condition where oftentimes you will flip uh, letters around in a word or um, in a thought. And so what I'd like for us to do is uh, we have been looking at the 73rd chapter of Psalms here. Now what I'd like for us to do is turn and we're going to, in my mind, this is what God laid on my heart that made me understand how then, Lord, can I stay in your sanctuary? How, Lord, can I be firm in your sanctuary? So we flip those two numbers, 73, and we turn over to the 37th chapter of the book of Psalms. Interesting enough, David is dealing with the same circumstances as Asaph was dealing with in the 37th chapter of Psalms. And so if we understand what Asaph was telling us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the writing of those words, that in order for us to understand, even at that point where we're so discouraged that uh, we just can't handle it. And then he says, we're in this, we need to go into the sanctuary of the Lord and that's where we'll understand uh, their end. Uh, David, uh, considering the same thing in the 37th uh, chapter, notice that first verse in the 37th chapter of Psalms, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither in the green herb. 
And so this morning, if there's anything that I want us to take away from this morning, it's going to be a four-step approach to remaining in the sanctuary of the Lord. And I believe that these four steps is a progression. At least that's what it is in my own life. Uh, and let me emphasize to you right up front, uh, if you could see my Bible now, uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of scribbling around this chapter. Uh, I oftentimes have to come back to this chapter and study even again the lessons that are put forth uh, by David in this consideration of the prosperity uh, of the wicked. He says there in that third verse, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. So the first step in being in the sanctuary of the Lord is the obvious. We must learn first to trust in the Lord. How can we understand, how can we enter into his sanctuary if we have not first trusted in him? And that trust that's used there is more than just a head knowledge, more than just filling our uh, head with facts that would, um, uh, that would point to um, uh, things that would help us to under This is a, a fellowship, a trusting that comes through the fellowship of knowing his son, Jesus Christ, as our personal savior. So trust is paramount, paramount in, in understanding that. We could again go and uh, see in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings, another instance where there was someone, uh, you all recall uh, Elijah and the experience that he had. Uh, he had just came off of some tremendously high, uh, spiritually uh, highs. Uh, uh, he had just experienced what it was like to challenge the, um, uh, the uh, false priest of the uh, uh, false gods of Jezebel. And, and uh, it was there where, remember, he had uh, uh, challenged them there to, um, uh, to put, and even to the point where he poured water across the altar. And I'm just uh, getting through that as quickly as possible. We're all quite familiar with that. We could go over this morning, but uh, to save time, I'll just allude to it. And so he come off of a tremendously uh, high spiritual experiences. Uh, and then Jezebel comes out and says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to make it my life's job to make sure that I do everything that you had done uh, uh, to the priest here. I'm going to do every, the false priest, I'm going to do everything that I possibly can do to bring an end to your life. And remember, it was that point that uh, uh, Elijah goes over and he just finds him a place and he just uh, uh, sits there. And even to the point so discouraged he becomes that he even says, Lord, just go ahead and take my life. I'm done with this. I, I just I, I just can't go anymore. And it's at that point that God comes to him and feeds him there. Uh, and then on in the following verses, we uh, see that uh, uh, God tells him to go over and sit down by the side. And there was a great wind that came. And the scripture tells us that God was not in the wind. There was an earthquake that came and God was not uh, in the earthquake. Uh, it was not until... Uh, 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 Elijah was able to hear um, uh, the small, still voice of the Lord that he was able to understand that God was there for him and was going to carry him through uh, the, that period of time in his life. Uh, Elijah was able to find, again, that sanctuary of the Lord that comes by trusting him. And as we have those experiences and come to the end of them, that trusting builds our faith in him in a tremendous way. Uh, again, look at Abraham and the experience that was uh, uh, shown to him through the sacrificing of his only son, Isaac, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, absolute necessity that uh, he trusted in God and God provided the ram uh, in the bushes. And so obviously um, uh, we have to begin our foundation of uh, defeating discouragement in our life by trusting in the Lord. And then the next step is, so number one is trust. Uh, next is, delight thyself in, also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Again, this is a progression. At least uh, I, I discover it to be a progression in my own life. 
how in the world am I going to learn to delight myself in the Lord if I have not first learned to trust him? That again, the foundation is trust. And then I begin to delight myself in him. How do we delight ourselves in the Lord? How do we continually um, uh, stay in this sanctuary uh, of the Lord? We stay in that sanctuary by learning to delight ourselves in him, having first uh, trusted in him. Uh, Deb is stand, uh, sitting behind me. Uh, and as I look back on our days of uh, courtship, um, uh, she learned to delight me, uh, delight in being around me only after she realized that she could trust me. And that's the kind of relationship that we build with the Lord uh, as we begin to trust him more fully, we begin to delight in him. And how, does, how do we begin to delight in him? We spend more time with him. Uh, we are in his word more often. We, we uh, uh, speak to him in prayer and, and fellowship together. We commune together. And I think that's one of the uh, 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 reasons for such a detrimental time that we find ourselves in today. Um, uh, we learn to delight ourselves in him uh, by delighting ourselves in the company of those who have like faith. And that's why it's so um, important for us to understand the importance of getting back into God's house, joined together, uh, although the technology that we've been able to use in, in recent weeks has been absolutely tremendous. I was speaking to my mom last night on the phone, and she said she would just be so glad uh, when there was uh, a time where they would be able to just uh, freely go back into God's house and to worship uh, him. Uh, now, uh, she was also thanking God, I have to say, was thanking God that uh, uh, they allowed her beauty salon to finally open up so she could go have her hair done. Uh, but uh, uh, paramount in her mind in our conversation was uh, that she would be able to go back into the house of the Lord. And I think that's uh, uh, the encouragement that we're able to see as these uh, restrictions are beginning to be uh, released. And so uh, we delight ourselves in the Lord uh, and he shall uh, uh, give us the desires of our heart. Um, no way, shape, form, or fashion does this verse indicate that uh, God is a God that will give us a, a pie in the sky type things. It's been amazing to me over the years, as I'm sure each of you have experienced as well. Uh, as we learn to delight in the Lord, uh, uh, how that the desires of our heart uh, really takes a turn. Uh, uh, the things that we begin to reflect upon the most really, and, and, and again, going back to this idea of the prosperity of the wicked, uh, as we see and understand the value in delighting ourselves in the Lord, having first trusted in him, we're able then to see um, uh, how important it is uh, to not spend time concerning ourselves over the prosperity of the wicked. Uh, if we do, uh, then we're going to certainly uh, lose footing on that slippery slope. Uh, and then that next verse there, verse number five says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. When I was studying through these verses and, and uh, struggling with that time in my life, um, I, I looked there and I thought, well, uh, okay, so I do, Lord, I want to commit my way unto you. I want to know that I am totally committed unto you. It was during this period of time uh, that uh, I began to realize, as I stated earlier, that sometime we can become so busy doing the work for the Lord, we miss the work of the Lord in our own lives. And I realized that uh, uh, I had began to uh, 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 do a lot of preparation for the responsibilities that I had there uh, at the church. But in that preparation, I had missed out on really truly learning to delight in him. And so um, I, I committed, I was committed, I was doing all the things that uh, uh, was expected of me and, and uh, even beyond what was expected. But at the same time, I was missing out on delighting myself in the Lord. And so I had to stop at one point and say, 
okay, then Lord, uh, I want to be committed, and 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 I know that the scripture there says that you will bring it to pass. I think it's interesting in those words there that he does not say what it is he would bring to pass. Uh, I know I've heard a lot of people say uh, uh, that the scripture says, and this too shall pass. Uh, those exact words are not actually in the Bible, but perhaps this verse is is uh, uh, leaning or pointing toward uh, that thought, that idea, that if we will commit ourselves unto the Lord, truly commit ourselves unto him, then he shall bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? Whatever it is that we are struggling with at the given moment. Had there been a list of things that was given here uh, by David, then uh, certainly we would have been inclined to only consider those things that was listed. But the emphasis here is commit ourselves on the Lord and he will bring it to pass, whatever it is that is occurring in our life. But we're not going to commit ourselves to the Lord uh, until we have first learned to delight ourselves in him. We're not going to learn to delight ourselves in him until we have first trusted in him. Again, going back to uh, uh, our relationship with our wives and, and uh, uh, our uh, uh, life partners that we have uh, uh, devoted ourselves to, committed ourselves to, uh, there was no way, shape, form, or fashion that Deb was going to um, uh, uh, say yes in that little pizza hut uh, or uh, uh, there uh, in Hateful, Georgia, as we sat there at that table and I took the ring out. Uh, 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 she has just corrected me. It was the Italian oven, not the uh, uh, Pizza Hut. Uh, we were sitting there at the table and and uh, uh, I had it all planned out. I had it planned to uh, have playing on the uh, jukebox. Uh, and we all remember those jukeboxes. Uh, uh, bridge over troubled waters. And I had this whole thing planned out that I was going to speak to her about my desire to be her bridge over troubled waters. And the very night that we went there, they had taken that song off of the jukebox. Uh, but my, my point here is to say, she was not going to learn to commit to me. She would not have said yes uh, to that uh, had, I, had she not first learned to delight herself in me and would not have delighted herself into me uh, until she had fully and completely trusted in my ability to be by her side uh, through troubled waters over that, uh, to be that bridge during those times of troubled waters. And so it's so important for us to understand we must first learn to trust him, delight in him, and then to commit our way unto him. And then in the uh, sixth verse there, he says, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. And then here's the final step. And I gotta tell you, uh, this step is one of the hardest things for most of us. I'll raise my hand and say, for me. In the seventh verse, it says there, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's hard for us to do, isn't it? It's hard for us to, we want to see instantaneous uh, responses, particularly in the society we're in today where uh, we can instantly get um, uh, uh, a picture in front of us. We can instantly reach out. Uh, we're in a society today where um, uh, if we get down the road and realize that we've left our cell phone at home, we're inclined to run back and get the cell phone because we want somebody to be able to instantly get in touch with us. Uh, I praise God that we have a God that we can instantly reach out to. But there are times in our life where he is calling upon us to rest in him and to wait patiently upon him. Let him bring about the things in uh, uh, his plan for our life. We've all heard it said before, and it's so true, that today we see uh, uh, the underside of the tapestry that's being put together called our life. 
but God uh, on the uh, side of heaven is looking down upon the pieces as they come together uh, uh, more beautifully than ever imagined as he brings about circumstances in our life. Uh, it was during this period of discouragement in my own life uh, that I learned the value of learning to rest in him. And now when I find myself uh, in a uh, uh, beginning to approach that slippery slope, uh, then I come back to this particular portion of the scripture and I say to myself, am I Lord waiting patiently upon you? Am I truly uh, 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 resting in you? And if I'm not, then I have to say, okay, Lord, uh, then somewhere along the way, and again, this goes to the progression that I mentioned a moment ago, then somewhere along the way, I must be not committing myself unto you the way in which you would have me to do. And if I'm not committing myself, then I have fallen short in spending time alone with you, Lord, and learning the value and delighting myself in you and allowing you to establish the desires of my heart. And then I say to myself, okay, so which point along this line have I begun to drift away from? Is it resting? Is it commitment? Is it delight? If I find myself in that position where I have uh, uh, begun to uh, 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 drift away from spending time along with the Lord and, and praying and studying his word, uh, then I go one more step up and I say, Lord, have I become uh, 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 a point of lack of diligence in trusting in you and knowing that, Lord, uh, uh, you are going to verily feed me every step along the way. And so those are the steps there. If we want to remain fully committed and fully established in the sanctuary of the Lord, we must first learn to trust. We must secondly learn to delight ourselves in him. Thirdly, commit our way into him. And then by all means, learn to rest in him and wait patiently upon him. One of the things that has meant so much to me in my life was uh, an elderly gentleman once shared with me that uh, 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 oftentimes we think of our life uh, and we think to ourselves that things are supposed to go along smoothly because of our faith in God. But the fact of the matter is from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, we know that God never promised us a rose garden. In fact, he really told us that there was going to be more occasions where it was nothing near a rose garden. But the one thing that he does promise us, again, from the first verse in the book of Genesis to the last book in Revelation, last verse, he does promise us that while our life will not be a rose garden, he will be our gardener. And there's been times in my life where the gardener has come to me. Imagine if you would a plant in your own garden. And imagine if that plant had the ability to reason and to think. Imagine the feeling that that plant must have when he sees the gardener coming toward him with the pruning shears and the hoe and the pick in his hands and the gardener begins to chop that dirt up around his roots and takes those pruning shears and begins to snip away at the uh, branches. Imagine the grimacing that that plant certainly must experience as he sees that gardener coming toward him. I believe we, as the gardener in our own lives, as Christ is our gardener, as he comes to us, and there's been times in my life where he has chopped that dirt up around my feet and at the given moment, that act is not very pleasant. And he begins to prune back those uh, uh, limbs and those pieces of my life. Uh, but then in the end, I realize as I look back on those times, as I uh, reflect upon them, I realize that every single action that the Lord, our gardener, has taken in my life, 
My life has not been a rose garden, but praise God, he has been our garden. And those things that he has done has strengthened me in my walk with him. And in so doing, I rest in him because I have committed my way to him. I committed my way into him because I learned to delight in him. I learned to delight in him because I first trusted in him. And so thanks for the opportunity to, to share uh, some uh, uh, times in my own life and, and the, uh, in the devotions that God has sent me to uh, in order to get through those periods of time. And so um, I'll say that the time is uh, very, very short here. And so uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and then uh, uh, we'll all uh, join back together in the worship center or in your cars there in the uh, parking lot. And I look forward to seeing each and every single uh, one of you. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we thank you, Father God, for the great and the awesome God that you are. Thank you, God, that you are our gardener. Thank you, Father, that you uh, are there for us in the most difficult circumstances that we can imagine. Father, thank you for the watch care. Thank you for the ability to come to you in prayer and to speak specifically of our needs. But Father, even more than speaking specifically of our needs, the opportunity to come and to fellowship with you, to delight ourselves in you, to learn what it means to trust and to wait patiently upon you in every aspect of our life. Thank you for these examples that you've given us time and time again through your word, uh, where these great men of God have experienced like circumstances in their own lives. And Father, how uh, through the word of God, we're able to learn how to deal with those circumstances. We pray now, Father, you would be with Casey, our pastor, as he brings the message this morning. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, uh, God's word will be presented in such a way that lives will be saved. Uh, that Christians will be revived, our hearts will be encouraged as we hear from your word. Uh, Father, we uh, uh, this morning ask that you would drive Satan from this place. He has no business being uh, amongst us as we come together and worship you in your sanctuary where we understand the end of him uh, therein. We pray, Father, for the blessings of our nation. Uh, we pray, dear God, that you would continue to lead our uh, governmental leaders uh, as they make decisions that infect, uh, impact us uh, today and not only today, but as we go forward into the future. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.